my, from my experience, students have a lot of difficulty with example five, this type of a thing. And I don't want to do this example when you're already destroyed and like just waiting for class to end. So while your brain is still relatively fresh, I wanted to talk about it. Um, so they tell us that a rectangle is to be inscribed in an ellipse. And I want to take this opportunity to tell you what the word inscribed means. And I also want to review what an ellipse looks like. Okay. So let's start with the ellipse thing. Um, the general equation of an ellipse looks like this. It's going to be x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. Okay. And when you have an ellipse that looks like that, um, you can draw it as follows. So if you have a set of axes like this, an ellipse is basically an oval. It's a symmetric oval. So you got to pretend that's symmetric. Uh, it's close enough. And the values of a and minus a go at these two endpoints of the ellipse. And then you got b and minus b. And those are the endpoints of the ellipse there. So if we were to try to graph our situation, our situation looks like this. And um, we could rewrite this equation as x squared over 2 squared plus y squared over 1 squared is equal to 1. Okay. So when I go to graph this ellipse, I can go, here's 1. Or maybe I should draw my ellipse first, and then I'll label the points. It's not terrible slightly twisted, but just pretend that's a good ellipse. And that makes this point, oops. That makes up uh, this point two and this point negative two and this point one and this point negative one. Okay. That's what we have. Is there any questions for me so far? So let me draw a sequence of pictures. So I told you that I needed to talk about what inscribed means. And um, inscribed means it's inside, it's drawn inside the ellipse. So this means it's um, drawn inside the ellipse. But it's not drawn inside like this. Like It's not like we put a rectangle in there like that. Usually the corners of the rectangle, um, the corners of the rectangle are on the ellipse. So I'm going to draw a variety of pictures. So like one picture of the rectangle could be like this. Okay, or I could maybe move like this. Or maybe I could even go like this. Oops. That's where my right, that's where my, uh, Ellipse is a little bit twisted, so it looks a little off. Okay. So if you were paying attention to how I drew each of those things, what I did was I specified a point x, y. And then once you pick this one point here, the other three points are determined. It's like you would reflect the x value to get this point. 
you reflect the y value to get this point, you'd reflect both the x and the y value to get this point. Same thing with all these guys. Once you specify this one point, then you're going to get all sides of the rectangle. Does that make sense? So x, y, and x, y. Okay. Another thing that's kind of cool is that if you imagine, so, okay, I have this point, I move it, my rectangle gets narrower and narrower and narrower. If I move it right here, I have a degenerate rectangle, right? But then when I move it all the way back over here, this is the same rectangle as this. Like I have repeated rectangles. So what we can really say is that all the rectangles are gonna be specified by moving this point here in the first quadrant. So um, we can really say, oh, x is greater than or equal to zero, and y is also greater than or equal to zero. Since other values of x and y describe the same rectangles. Is there any questions about that? Like, I hope you guys can see if I put my point here, I get one rectangle. If I move the point all the way around to here, I'm gonna get the same rectangle. So you don't need to, you only need to worry about these guys. Okay, so um, let us um, continue with this problem. What is it that we're trying to maximize? Well, let's keep reading. We should, what should the dimensions of the rectangle be to maximize its area? So in this case, we're looking to maximize the area. So let's write down an equation for the area. Area of rectangle. Or I should say maximize the area. I just want to maximize the area. So what is the, um, if you looked at this, what do you guys think the area would be in terms of X and Y? Why don't you type your answer in the chat box? If you want, any thoughts? You have one vote for X times Y. If you just chose X times Y, that would give you this area right here. Someone have a different guess than X plus Y? Four X times Y sounds right because this is just one fourth of it. So if you want the whole thing, you got four x y like this. That's right, four x y. Okay. Um, next, we need a constraint equation. Does anybody know what our constraint equation is going to be? I'm hoping it's obvious, but maybe it's not. Anyone know what the constraint equation is? You can just say it or describe it. We had one guess. Um, I guess is not correct. What is the relationship between X and Y? Is there some equation that relates X and Y? Keeping in mind that X and Y have to stay on this ellipse. Yes, Jasper, that is correct, right? So our constraint equation is the ellipse itself. This is the constraint equation.
So this constraint equation is x squared over four plus y squared is equal to one. This means that y is equal to one minus x squared over four. So, I'm sorry, y squared is equal to that. That tells you that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of one minus x squared over four. But we're not gonna worry about the negative values of, of um, x and y. So we're not gonna worry about this uh, negative part. So in the end, my constraint equation is going to be y equal to one minus x squared over four to the one half power. And we're going to take that and we're going to substitute it into our area function. So you got a x y like this. It's going to be four x times one minus x squared over four to the one half power. Does that make sense for everybody? Oh, now that's just a function in terms of X. So I can write it in terms of a single variable. So it should feel like there's a pattern. You figure out what you're trying to maximize. You have a constraint equation. You substitute it in, use the constraint equation to eliminate a variable. And then now we have this um, function that we can differentiate. So what is the, what rule do I need to use to take the derivative of this guy? What rule, what's the fundamental rule? Like when you look at this, I don't see a chain rule first. I see something else first. product rule, two functions multiplied together. So um, we use the product rule, the derivative of four X is just four. You keep the second thing, which is one minus X squared over four to the one half, All right? And then you got plus, now you get to take the derivative of the second thing. So the second thing is here. Here is where we use the chain rule. So this is one half, one minus x squared over four. Wonder who that was. I no longer answer phone calls I don't recognize. Maybe they'll leave a message. Um, you bring down the power, you subtract ones, you got negative one half here. We're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's going to be negative two x. I'm sorry, um, negative one half x. Right. And then we're going to multiply by the first function, which is four x. Is there any uh, questions about that? So we can simplify a little bit. Um, we have a two here and a two here. That's gonna cancel with the four. Uh, we're gonna have two X's. So that's gonna give you an X squared. So this derivative can really be written as four times one minus X squared over four to the one half plus X squared times one minus X squared over four to the negative one half. And we need to find the critical values of this. Okay, so, um, so I want to draw your attention to these powers. Got a power here and a power here. And I want you to notice the difference of the powers. is one. In other words, if you did one half minus negative one half, you get one. That's really good for us. Let me show you why it's really good. We're gonna factor out the smaller 
term. So we're going to have 1 minus x squared over 4 to the negative 1 half. And what happens when we pull that out? Well, the 4 definitely stays on the inside. But you're basically subtracting negative 1 half from 1 half. So this is going to become 1 minus x squared over 4 to the first power. And you can check your answer by distributing. So if I have this and I distribute it in, you would add the powers and you would get a 1 half. So this fact right here is really nice for finding critical values because I hate working with fractional powers, like with radicals. Okay. The second term is even easier. You just get plus x squared like this. Okay. And what we're going to do next is we are going to, um, we're going to simplify the inside there. So it's 1 minus x squared over 2. This would give you a uh, 4 minus x squared plus x squared. And you distribute the 4. So um, oh, I made a mistake. Wait. Did I make a mistake here? I think this is right. I think this is right. Okay, so um, oh no, I made a mistake. I forgot this negative right here. So I really need to put that back. I apologize. Right, this looks better. Okay. Yeah, Terry, you're correct. Um, where did the power go? So a student asks, where did the negative one half power go? We have to distribute, right? So like, there's two terms. There's one term here and one term here. And when I distribute, that gives me the one half power. When I distribute to this guy, that gives me the negative one half. Does that make sense? So I'm really factoring. I'm factoring this guy out. When I factor this guy out, you just have an x squared left over. Does that make sense? from the third to the fourth step, from here to here. So I distribute. This gives you four times one is four, four times negative x squared over four is just negative x squared. Does that make sense? The negative one half power is out here. I factored it out. So you have this expression and then I pulled it out. It's like if you have, if you have a C plus B X squared and you pull out a b, what happens? You would get c over b, and then you just have an x squared remaining. Oh, you mean here? I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood what you were asking. You're absolutely right. I, 
I misunderstood. I thought you were, I thought you were asking about the factory. You're, you're, no, 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 you're right. That's my bad, that's my bad. Sorry. Totally thought you were asking something else. And then this would be um, four minus two X squared like this. Okay. So uh, this is taking up a lot of room here. Mm, give me one sec, let me rescale this. Okay. So now I got to, um, set this equal to zero to get the critical values. So we set this equal to zero. Um, oh, and there's a negative, sorry. Um, so now we got to see when each factor is equal to zero. Okay. So when is ah? Uh, need to eat breakfast. Um, sorry. I made a copying mistake, right? The denominator is four, not two. So, oh my God, going crazy. Here we are. So we need to set each factor equal to zero. So if I have one minus X squared over four equal to zero, that's the same thing as saying X squared over four is equal to one, which is the same thing as saying X squared is equal to four which is the same thing as saying x is equal to plus or minus two. Okay. Those are two critical values. But I want to refer back to our original problem over here. If you have your x value here equal to two, you're gonna get a degenerate rectangle. You're gonna get a rectangle that's basically two lines on top of each other, and that has no area. So I think either of these two cases is going to result in results in degenerate triangles. Or degenerate rectangles. So now we want to set the other factor equal to zero. So we're going to have um, four minus two X squared equal to zero. This gives you two X squared is equal to four. This gives you X squared is equal to two. This gives you X is equal to plus or minus rad two. Okay. Now, we only really need to worry about the positive values of X because we know that when you have negative values of X, you're just gonna get the same rectangle repeated. Um, so the last thing we need to do is we need to show that this is a, uh, a maximum. So I would run the first derivative test. You know, you have rad two over here like this. Um, rad two is approximately like 1.414. So you could use a test point like uh, a prime of one and you would see that it's increasing. You could try a prime of 1.5 and it's decreasing. So this means that you have a max at rad two. X equal to rad two, maybe I should say. So this tells me that y, which was equal to the square root of one minus x squared over four, that's equal to square root of one minus two over four, that's equal to square root of one half. That's gonna be the y value. So we have our x value, we have our y value, and the dimensions are 
read to, oops, read to by rad one over t. Does that make sense for everybody? All right. Okay. So um, 